my prescriptions. Not the illegal pills I bought on the street. The official prescriptions with my name on them. And they took them from me simply because I had no business being prescribed them in the first place. <laughs> but oh, the collection I had. All the effort, all the work that went into it. Do you know how hard it is to get a doctor to write you a prescription for a pill you don't need? <laughs> it's not hard. <laughs> It's so easy, it's so, it's so easy. Here's what you do, or here's what I did, but don't do it, but if you did do it, it would totally work. Okay. Um, go on, uh, go on like WebMD. Search doctors in your zip code, okay? And then sort the results. Lowest rating to highest. You will not need to scroll far. Find the doctor in your area with the lowest number of stars. This person needs your business. Is this a bad doctor? Nay, nay. This is the best doctor. Dude. You can walk in there, and it's like Captain Phillips. You can be like, look at me. I am the doctor now. You can use their computer. Check Yahoo News or something. I had a doctor in New York City that just wrote me prescriptions. Dr. Michael, no last name. Oh, I don't mean I'm protecting his identity. He never told me his last name. <laughs> Even before the pandemic, Dr. Michael worked out of his apartment on 2nd Avenue. That's odd. I'd go to see Dr. Michael, and I'd knock on his door, and he'd always answer the door like this. He'd go, my wife Minerva is sleeping. Like, really paranoid. But he wasn't saying, so keep your voice down. It was as if he was saying, I didn't just kill my wife Minerva. <laughs> So then we'd go into his kitchenette. To call it a kitchen would be a great exaggeration. And we'd have our appointment. I'd go, I want Klonopin. And he'd go, okay. And as he was writing it out on the pad and tearing it off, he'd go, oh, what's it for? And I'd go, I have anxiety. And he'd go, oh, then you need it. And then Dr. Michael, he'd always go, Hey, you want a flu shot? <laughs> Aww. <laughs> he wanted to be like a real doctor. <laughs> I go, no, Michael, you already gave me two flu shots this month, man. I feel crazy. I feel super sick. Then he go, do you want a B12 shot? You want a vitamin shot? So he always wanted to give me a shot of some kind, because he had, like, a thing. I mean, look, a guy named Dr. Michael that works out of his apartment is gonna have a thing. Michael's thing was he wanted guys to take their shirts off in his apartment. You're all uncomfortable now, but I'm way over it. And also, if you think this story ends with me being like, and I said, Absolutely not. You're about to be so disappointed. <laughs> so we had this little, like, charade. I'd roll up my T-shirt sleeve, and Michael would come in with the syringe, and he'd go, um, I'm gonna need the whole shirt off. <laughs> I'd be like, 30 clonopin, two refills, whoop! And then the sexual harassment would stop, to be fair. So maybe that was his whole thing, was just getting guys to take their shirts off. Or maybe there was something about me with my shirt off that stops sexual harassment. <laughs> you know, that story has two morals. 
One, now you know that. <laughs> you didn't used to. The other moral is this. You should get vaccinated and get a booster and all of that. But these days, when you hear people be like, just trust doctors. <laughs> Anytime you hear someone say, trust doctors, just remember, somewhere in a kitchenette <laughs> sits Dr. Michael. And if he's so trustworthy, why is Minerva always sleeping? <laughs> so they took my prescription. They take my prescriptions. Now this was all at four o'clock in the morning when I first checked into rehab. Let's flash forward 12 hours now to 4 p.m. that same day. I'm used to say goodbye, nothing new to me. Maybe I'm trying to survive and I know that you believe. Believe in a world with happy endings. So tired of pretending that everything's all right while I stay asleep. So let it go. My hospital room in the detox hospital at this rehab. I had to go to detox for like four or five days when I first got there because of everything in my system. I'm in my hospital room. I've been in rehab at this point for 12 hours. I have not gone to sleep during that time. And my total time awake to this point is 50 hours. Now, the doctors are trying to give me a bunch of medication to calm me down. But by this point in my life, my tolerance for sedatives was superhuman. No matter what they give me, they cannot subdue me. I'm like the great Rasputin. They cannot bring me to my knees. <laughs> Just then, a legitimately good doctor walks into my hospital room. If you have only been seeing Dr. Michael <laughs> for the past few years, a good, legitimate doctor is terrifying. It's like an exorcist. This guy walked in like, hi, I'm Dr. Henry Fortescue. I was like, no, two names. <laughs> no. Oh, hey, you want my shirt off, huh? You like this? You like stuff? What kind of a doctor are you, huh? Is your wife dead? <laughs> Ash. I scream at this doctor. I go, where's my clonopin? We cannot give you your clonopin. Why not? We are a rehab. <laughs> I cannot give you a Schedule II narcotic under Pennsylvania state law. And I said, Pennsylvania state law? Well, what if we go to a pharmacy in New Jersey? <laughs> you see, I thought he was telling me about a predicament <laughs> that we were both caught up in. <laughs> like he was like, look, I would love to give you these pills. You are clearly a super chill young man bobbing and weaving in a hospital gown and a pair of New Balance sneakers for the past 12 hours. But this pesky state of Pennsylvania. Aho, oh, doctor! What if we go to a pharmacy in New Jersey? Oh my God, no one has ever thought of that. You're the first drug addict here to have a scheme. Let's go in my car. You're clearly ready to leave the grounds. <laughs> that was at 4 p.m. Three hours later, 7 p.m., I finally go to sleep. They give me enough of this drug called Librium, and I drop. They put a nurse in my hospital room to make sure I stay asleep, because I had been trouble. <laughs> I'm not sure what it was exactly that got them so worried, but it might have been when I said, I'm gonna pretend to go to sleep. <laughs> and then when you're all like, he's asleep and you leave my room, I'm gonna run the fuck out of this rehab. <laughs> Something about saying that 
out loud twice to two different staff members had raised a few eyebrows. So now I'm asleep though, I'm legitimately out cold. They have a nurse in my room to make sure I stay asleep. She's sitting in a chair next to a bedside table. I'm asleep in the bed. My phone is face up on the bedside table next to her. Now, at this exact same time, about 7 p.m., my good friend Pete Davidson starts calling me. Pete, yes, that one. Pete <laughs> was not at my intervention because he was traveling that night. But now he's landed, he's found out I'm in rehab, and he's concerned, so he starts calling. Fun fact about Pete. He changes his cell phone number constantly. I don't know why. That's his journey. <laughs> but every month and a half, I get a text from Pete, and it says, yo, it's Pete, new number. And I go, send a pic to prove it. And he sends a photo like this. And then I save him in my phone. For a long time, I just kept saving him again and again as Pete Davidson. At one point, I had nine Pete Davidsons <laughs> saved in my phone. And uh, that's uh, too many Pete Davidsons! <laughs> so, I started to save him under fake famous people's names, just to mix it up. Like, for a while, he was saved in my phone as Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> the week I went to rehab, he was saved in my phone as Al Pacino. <laughs> so, I'm asleep in bed. A nurse is watching over me. My phone is next to the nurse. And Pete Davidson starts calling again and again and again. But what the nurse sees on the phone <laughs> is that this unconscious patient is getting not one, not two, but five missed calls from Oscar winner <laughs> Al Pacino. So, she fucking wakes me up. <laughs> I don't blame her. 